Right, folks, welcome back to the podcast. So today we are talking about hate speech. So what is hate speech? Who does it affect? And is it even a thing? And so my my motivation for wanting to do this episode is I've always sort of referred to myself as a like a free speech absolutist. Anything goes. Short of direct calls to, to violence or yelling fire in a crowded theatre, um, I think people should be allowed to say anything they like. And I've always sort of, I've debated this in the pub with people and with family and what have you, and I've always sort of managed to come out unscathed. But I suspect there's some, whenever you've got an absolutist position on something, I suspect there's some weaknesses inherent within it, even if I've not been able to spot them myself. So I thought the best thing to do with this is to steel man the opposing view by speaking with somebody who's thought about this a lot more deeply than I have. So my guest today is Professor Jeremy Waldron. Jeremy is Professor of Legal and Political Philosophy at the New York University School of Law. He has written extensively on jurisprudence and political theory and is the author of numerous articles and books, including The Dignity of Legislation, uh, torture, Terror and Trade-Offs, Philosophy for the White House, and the book which forms the basis of today's discussion, which is The Harm of Hate Speech. So, Jeremy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. Thank you very much, Danny. Thanks for having me. Oh, go on, give it another flash there, the book. <laughs> That's the one. So, okay. yes, it's a very, it's a very detailed and very deep book. Uh, and yeah, I recommend everyone go out and buy it. It's probably... Um, well, I'm guessing it's the, it's the best book out there on the subject because it's the you go on Google and for, for hate speech and all roads lead to that particular book. Um, so I've done my best to, to delve into it. I mean, there's no way we're going to get into everything today. So go out and buy the book. Um, but let's start with this. So I'm going to try. <laughs> I'm going to try and summarize the uh the, the the basic proposition that you make in the book in a short of in in one paragraph and then if you want to make any corrections to this um please do but th this is what we're going to sort of pick apart and and yeah delve into a bit deeper so basically in a well-ordered society the dignity of every citizen is an inalienable right which is therefore the duty of the government to uphold and protect since hate speech threatens to undermine the dignity of the people to whom it is aimed, laws restricting its expression are warranted. Would you want to add anything or correct anything there? No, that's that's a, a perfectly fair summary, very concise, in fifteen words or less of the um, <laughs> of the of the overall gist of the book. Let me just say one word about dignity, and I'm sure we'll say a lot more about it as the yes, we will. Yeah, discussion goes on. But by the dignity of each citizen, what I primarily mean is the, 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 their fundamental civic reputation, the, the sense that other people around them have that this is just an ordinary person in good standing, one member of the community among others, is to be treated like any other member of the community, who is not to be treated as a criminal or deviant uh, unless they've actually, that's actually been established by law. So the dignity is just the civic status the ordinary civic status. It's not supposed to be anything transcendental. Right. It's not supposed to be anything Kantian in terms of the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. It's a very mundane notion of just being one person among others in good standing. And what I have in mind for a well-ordered society is a society that offers each citizen some minimal assurance that they will be treated in that light by the people around them. Okay. Right, so yeah, it sort of gives us four four themes to sort of delve in today, and one is one is is hate speech, and we're doing hate speech like this because um, even you questioned the the validity or the the use the utility of that particular phrase. Um, then the concept of dignity, concept of a well ordered society, and then I guess what's what would be my primary concern as as a conservative, as a, a free speech absolutist, as I proclaim to be for the moment at least anyway um this idea of of government intervention of of lawmakers deciding what people can and can't say and how they can and can't express various ideas um so let's just i guess let's start with this let's let's start by defining hate speech and talking about um 
what exactly do we mean by hate speech? It's a very broad term. It's applied very broadly. Um, and how, what would you see as a, a what would you use as a, a preferred definition or a preferred term? Yeah, thanks, Danny. The, the, um, the term is one that we're sort of stuck with. So even if it's not a particularly helpful term, it's, it's, uh, it has to be our starting point. It's a basis on which we can make this topic intelligible to an audience. But when we talk about hate speech, the question is what's the relationship supposed to be between the hate and the speech? Um, one possibility is that we think of the hate as the motivation for the speech. And so a law against hate speech is trying to stop speech from being motivated by hatred. And that's emphatically not what I have in mind and not what most um, uh, legislation has in mind. It has in mind a relationship at the other end where the speech gives rise to hatred, where the speech stirs up or promotes hatred, where the speech incites hatred. And almost all of the definitions in the various pieces of legislation that you find around the world basically put the relationship in that order. So what is, what is prohibited is speech which is intended to stir up hatred against a section of the community, speech that is intended to defame a section of the community and lower them in the estimation of others, speech that's intended in a way to whip up uh, intercommunal hatred. So it's, it's, I think, very important when we understand the term hate speech to, to bear in mind that that's the, that's the order of the relation. In the United States, we have something called hate crimes, whereby if I um, were to assault or murder somebody and it was shown that I did so for a racial reason, then that would be an aggravation of the offence and I'd be liable to a, a higher penalty. And in that case, we're dealing with that first relation between the hate and the motivation for the act. But that's not what's going on in the hate speech example. So hate speech, um, it's, it's, always about, it's almost always about incitement. It's almost always about um, stirring up hatred. So, uh, Danny, I come from New Zealand, and um, <clears throat> the New Zealand hate speech provision talks about words likely to excite hostility against any group of persons who are in New Zealand or who may be coming to New Zealand. In Britain, um, the, the Public Order Act um, talks about um, material, uh, a person publishing or distributing written material if he intends thereby to stir up racial hatred or if racial hatred is likely to be stirred up and he should have known that. Um, Germany, Canada, other jurisdictions have that, have that formulation or something, something like that. So we're really worried about the, <clears throat> the effect of the speech on the community generally, the, the effect of the speech on the attitudes of the community generally. The community may have had a particular neutral attitude towards a group, and the idea is that the hate speech tries to change that into hostility or contempt. Okay, so I mean, the, f the first thing that sort of springs up for me there is, um, so this is very similar to the, the law you quoted from New Zealand there. So this is Article 20, uh, Paragraph 2, I guess, of the International Co Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which says that the expression of hate, the, it's the expressions of hatred likely to stir up violence, hostility or discrimination must be prohibited by law. And the f right. the, so the thing that springs out to me there is this 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 word likely. Um, yeah. How how is that quantifiable? How how do we quantify whether or not something is likely to to stir up violence, hostility, or discrimination? Right. It's it's actually, of course, one of the most difficult aspects of this, and and um, the courts will generally proceed by using ordinary experience, or else they'll proceed by focusing on intention. Um, that is um, uh, the the intent of the person who was using who was using the speech in question. So there may be evidence that the person said, let's go up and stir up hatred against this group or that group. Okay. Or, um, but we have to, I mean, sometimes they use the phrase reasonably likely, that's used in the, in the, um, the New Zealand legislation. The um, International Covenant 
term talks about advocacy of racial or religious hatred that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence. And um, let's see, the Canadian provision talks about inciting hatred where such incitement is likely to lead to a breach of the peace. And the British provision um, just talks about the likelihood of stirring up racial, racial hatred. So we would presume that we could infer something about likelihood from A, the intention of the speaker, and B, uh, evidence about the impact of the speech on its audience, and C, common sense that people understand uh, what's likely to stir up contempt and hatred and what isn't. So, um, so, so I, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, so we've, got, so we've we've got intent and likeliness there as this sort of double standard. Um, yes. I don't mean I don't mean a double standard in that sense. I mean, um, no, I know a, a dual standard. A dual standard, yes. Yeah. Um, so, if somebody were if somebody was able to prove that their they their intent wasn't to cause um, offence, but they did say something which could say almost objectively um, get a rise out of the people that heard the information that's not then classed as hate speech? Um, no, not quite. Again, particularly, as say, looking at the British provision. So it's either intention or um, the objective likelihood, which the person ought to have known about, that this would stir up hatred. So, so recklessness in that sense or negligence in that sense might be punishable as well. But there would be a harder test to prove because you have to prove the objective likelihood apart from the intention of the speaker. Right, so I mean, to, to sort of test the veracity of various um, claims that we're going to make today, um, I'm I'm going to put out, I'm going to put forth some propositions that might seem um, contentious. So, for instance, um, using this using this dual standard, I'm glad you've corrected me on that because that sounds much better. <laughs> this dual standard <laughs> of, uh, of of intent and, and likeliness to cause discrimination. So. I'm, I'm just going to quote something here. This is from the Bureau of Justice Statistics, uh, criminal victimization in 2013. So, and I, there's, I, I'm not pick this for any particular reason. I'm going to sort of, I'm going to use examples from various different groups today to try and uh, pick on pick on people universally, I guess. Um, so, for instance, so in 2013, of the approximately 660,000 crimes of interracial violence that involve blacks and whites, Blacks were the perpetrators 85% of the time. This meant a black person was 27 times more likely to attack a white person than vice versa, and Hispanics were eight times more likely to attack a white person than vice versa. So there's me. I've just stated something there, which inevitably some people are going to hear that and it will rile them up. You know, they, they will feel that maybe, and maybe even people that had um, never um, bolted in, in this way before, are going to think, wow, like blacks commit uh, violent crimes against whites that much. Like that's, and that might stir something within them. Now, my, yeah. my, my intent isn't to do that. Um, but if, if somebody is, you see, I would say that's objectively likely to wind somebody up. Um, why is that, why is that not hate speech? Or am I, am I in a gray area there? Um, Danny, you're certainly in a gray area there, and it's an extremely, right. extremely interesting area. Right. The, the, there are some jurisdictions which make truth of the statement used a absolute defense to a prosecution for hate speech. Right, okay. Okay? Yeah. So that um, usually the onus would be on the speaker to prove the truth, and that can be quite a heavy burden at yeah. times. But, for example, the Canadian um, uh, criminal code says... No person shall be convicted of an offence under this subsection if he establishes that the statements communicated were true. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it's a it's a little bit like the way in which truth can be a defence in a defamation, in a defamation suit. And, and one way of thinking about hate speech is that it's a little bit like group defamation. It's a little bit like groups group libel or group slander. Well, sorry. Uh, let me just jump in quickly there, Jeremy. Just to, just to yeah. preempt, because while you're actually got, expanding on this point, could you actually explain as well the differences between um, defamation, slander, and libel? Because I see I kept tripping over them in in the research of this. So yeah, 
Yes, uh, defamation is a general term whereby uh, it refers to any any um, uh, action by one person that has a negative impact on the reputation of another person. That's right. defamation. If it's done by speaking, it's called slander. Right. If it's done, if it's if it's done by uh, in a relatively permanent medium like publication, it's called libel. For most purposes, um, libel and slander are treated the same. There's, there's one or two technical differences between them. Okay. Uh, usually, in, de in, in defamation claims, truth is a defense. But at common law, certainly, the defendant, that is the person who uttered the words complained of, that's the person who has the obligation to bring evidence to show that the proposition is true. In the case that you mentioned, the person would bring the source of the figures about interracial assaults that you that you mentioned. Right. Now, um, I only mention defamation because it provides a very useful analogy. And, and in America, certainly, uh, and in Europe, people sometimes develop an explicit analogy between hate speech and group defamation. The difference being with group defamation is that you're, you're, you're trying to assault the reputation of all the members of a group under the auspices of some common characteristic, which is partly how somebody might react to your claim about the assault statistics, you know, trying to defame any particular person, but you're trying to lower the reputation of uh, all people in the group. So um, there are going to be other cases and there are going to be other statutes where truth is not a defense. Um, I'm sorry to keep citing chapter and verse, but I'm a lawyer, Danny. And, no, no, it's and, fine. Uh, yeah. So the Israeli Penal Code, which prohibits hate speech, um, provides that for the purposes of this section, it does not matter whether the publication did cause racism, li likely to cause racism, that was what they were interested in, and it doesn't matter whether or not it is true. So the idea would be that, um, that if you intended to stir up hatred with a true statement, then the intention is 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 the is the criminal element and the truth is neither here nor there but as i say it differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction i think britain leaves it open um uh, as as to whether truth is a defense against hate speech and other jurisdictions like uh, france or germany or denmark uh, leave it open as well it remains as you said a gray a gray area and it's an interesting area because on the one hand, we don't want to stifle the expression of truth. We actually don't want to stifle uh, what you call the marketplace of ideas. Yep. We, we, we do want there to be an honest and open debate, even on controversial and sensitive subjects. On the other hand, we, we also want people to take some responsibility for the likely effects of what they say. You see, and just yes. simply folding their arms and saying, well, it's true, and therefore I don't have to answer the effects of saying it might seem a little bit irresponsible. Yeah, you see, for me, this is it's it's this idea of a grey area that's that sort of becomes problematic because I think then it becomes it with one one of the things I like about America. So I'm a fan of America. I, I, it was my dream to move to America. I'm never going to get there because my missus has got too many health problems. We'd never get health insurance over there. Um, so, but. So I think I believe, it may be, it's, it's, a, it's probably a romantic notion, but I believe to an extent in the idea of American exceptionalism. And I think one of the things that uh, backs that up for me is is the First Amendment and, and, and freedom of speech. And because America is pretty much the only, is it the only country in, in the world, in the Western world, that has, has got no hate speech laws? I think it's the only advanced democracy that yeah. has no hate speech laws. And, yeah. and where there's no hate speech laws, for me, that's sort of it's very black and white. It's clear what it's 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 clear what the the distinction is. And I think I've made the, stinct, the distinctions before. Short of explicitly calling for violence and yelling fire in a crowded theatre, which you know, the yelling fire in a crowded theatre is an interesting one. But if if you know there's not a fire in the, in the crowded theatre and you yell fire, then we've we've already established intent. Um, intent That's to right. Call, yes. Well, we're certainly we're certainly established irresponsibility. Yes, and um, so it actually it, it actually wasn't just an abstract idea. Back in 1913, when some miners were on strike in Michigan, uh, the miners were having a benefit to raise money for their their families and so on. It was a children's party. It was pre-Christmas, 
large number of people packed into a uh, miners' union hall, and a provocateur from the bosses came and screamed fire at the door, and there was a stampede, and a great many children were trampled oh, wow. and killed. Right. And there's, a, there's actually a Woody Guthrie song called 1913 Massacre. So that's where Justice Holmes's reference to fire in a crowded theatre came from. It was from... Uh, this is entirely a piece of trivia, Danny, but it's... No, it's, but an interesting one. And But, yeah, but you yeah. see, but for me, it's it's very much... If there is a grey area, it's it's a, it's a grey area that's that feels much easier to deal with. And then when we're talking about establishing intent and, um, you know, whether an, the likelihood, this sort of cause... Establishing a cause and effect relationship between speech and action... That grey area, to me, the bigger the grey area gets, the more susceptible it becomes to political partisanship. Um, and you know, I know, and I, I know, on on this the statue of outside all the courts is it's the the law is supposed to be blind or something. And it, but that's just, I mean, I know from the history of this podcast being a, a you know a psychology podcast that the idea of people being able to completely eradicate their own biases is is a ridiculous notion. And so the moment we bring in any sort of grey area or we expand the grey area, more people are likely to be found guilty of things of which they are not guilty, for one, but also found guilty of things that um that wouldn't have that wouldn't have been a problem before. So if you've got yeah. a, if you're in front of a left wing judge or in a, a predominantly left wing jurisdiction as a conservative speak in your mind those grey areas are going to apply more to you as a conservative than they might necessarily to um, a liberal. Yeah, I think I think these are fair points. Uh, let's think about a couple of ways of possibly mitigating them because the art of good legislative design is to use the details of the statute, the dual standard, the triple standard, the various tests that have to be passed before a prosecution can proceed in order to minimize the danger that you're talking about. So one thing that happens in the United Kingdom and in New Zealand, Australia, probably in Canada too, I think, is that these prosecutions cannot be mounted except by permission from the Attorney General uh, acting in his or her um, politically neutral capacity. Now, I know in this day and age, that's a, a already um, a ground for some skepticism. But it used to be the case that the Attorney General was understood to have both a political and a non-political side to their position. And certainly these prosecutions were not supposed to proceed without scrutiny from the office of the Attorney General. And the idea was that that would weed out some of the grey area cases, leaving the prosecutions to proceed only in the most egregious um, uh, and um, the, the most obvious cases. So that's the first point. The second point is um, it makes a difference what your um, what your burdens of proof are and what the uh, how the gray area is constructed because obviously sometimes um, uh, for the gray area it matters who has the obligation in the courtroom to make the argument who has the obligation to establish a b or c if that's the 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 um, the test that the legislation imposes. Normally, we say in a criminal prosecution, the, prosecu the prosecution has the, the burden to prove all the elements of the offence. And so that has an, an impact on how the grey area plays out. Third point and fourth point are, are, are less ponderous. They're just that law is full of grey areas. Yeah. We, we, we often, we don't legislate mechanically. We don't always legislate just using numbers or operationalized tests. We legislate to promote a certain amount of thoughtfulness. And fourthly, um, it's, it's just worth remembering that the primary impact of these laws is not on prosecutions per se. Primary impact is making people think twice right. before they act irresponsibly. And their gray area may actually be helpful. Somebody says, ah, I think I'd like to burn a cross on my property across the street from, from African-American homes on the same street, um, and then they pause and they think, hang on, cross-burning can be construed as hate speech. Maybe I should think twice. So um, these are not complete answers to your misgivings. 
I don't think it's just a matter of which judge you happen to end up in front of. Sometimes the most crusty conservative judges will come up with the most um, um, uh, furious denunciation of hate speech. And many left-wing judges are, uh, as you are, free speech absolutists in their, in, their, in their private views. So it's complicated. But I'm not denying for a moment that it's a difficult, it's a difficult area. Right, okay. So... Uh... Moving on, we sort of need to expand it a little bit because I, I gave this this example of criminal statistics from the United States, and that was a that was a statement, that was something I said. But in the book, you touch upon hate speech in this broader t broader sense of, of of group defamation, which also brings in other aspects. So um, things like um, so it's not just speech, publications, posters, leaflets, blogs, uh, even statues, things like that. Um, podcast um, podcast well any yeah i guess any any medium of communication really yeah. um and so the uh, you mentioned then this idea of a burning cross now one thing that was interesting to me in in the book is uh, a, a common example that you use you open the book with it um is is signage so these sort of these public demonstrations of, of hatred towards one group. So I think at the beginning of the book, it's a it's a, a Muslim man walking with his daughter down the street, and then he sees some Islamophobic um, uh, posters or signage, um, and then it, it's it's mentioned quite a lot in uh, chapter four, uh, a well ordered society. Um, now, I've got to say, Jeremy, I don't know whether because of you know you're arguing in favour of of bringing in hate speech legislation. And I'm not sure whether a lot of the the, the illusions that you uh, use for for signage, burning crosses and billboards and things like that, whether it struck me as a little bit hyperbole, like whether it served as a bit of a, a rhetorical device. It paints quite a dystopian picture, uh, yeah. but I think it's it's sort of it's unrepresentative unrepresentative of real life, and it's unrepresentative of what free speech absolutists desire. Because my question would be. You know, in America currently, there is no hate speech laws. Where are all these signs that are, um, you know, denouncing um, Muslims and gay people and things like that? Yeah. Um, number one, there are a number of these signs around. They have been eliminated largely, say, anti-Semitic signage has mostly been taken down. You, you still get the occasional swastika scrolled up on a wall. But the signs that used to be on the streets of Florida... Uh, near a hotel saying Jews and dogs prohibited. Um, those signs are no longer taken, uh, are no longer to be found. And part of it is, and this is a, a, an issue that we should talk about, that even as a matter of business practice, even as a matter of how you conduct your business, whether there's a law or not prohibiting that sort of signage, whether there's a law or not prohibiting hate speech, it's suicide for a business yeah. to engage in, in that sort of speech. Um, if you, if somebody were to go on national television and uh, uh, use racist speech, they would be out of their out of the job so quickly. So, the fact is that even though we're free speech absolutists in the United States, we're not free speech absolutists so far as ordinary civil relations are concerned. We have very very strong social codes, implicit codes that make it that, that make it less likely that you'll get these signs around. And the other thing to, to mention is just on the cross burning element, we've had enough cases come before the courts over the past 50 years to know that cross burning is a problem and that it does happen, not endemically, not every weekend, not every place, but often enough to reawaken old nightmares um, and often enough to, to uh, pose some sort of problem of apparent intimidation or apparent... Um, uh, demoralization of African-American communities, partly because we have real nightmares of endemic racism that can be reawoken. Can a nightmare be reawoken? We have a reality of, of, of racial terror. We have a reality of racial hatred that was there in the not-so-distant past, certainly within living memory, and that it can be reawoken uh, in the lives and consciousness of people. Europeans have that. I believe British people have that too, although part of the, the role of Britain in pioneering uh, hate speech legislation was to attempt to avert 
that sort of intercommunal hatred at the time when immigration was beginning to to gear up in the 1960s. Yeah, you so see, it, yeah, go ahead, please. Well, what you see for me, you've already put my my argument forward for me there. You know, that it's for me. I, I would argue why why bring the government in on this when the, the there's already the social codes in place. So I mean, for one. You know, I don't. I don't want to see. It. I don't want to see signage anywhere. I don't think signage should be permitted, like fly posting or whatever it is, in a, in a public square. Because I'm. I pay my taxes towards that public square. So does a Muslim person. So does a gay person, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so nobody wants to see your stupid racist signs up. I don't. I don't even want to see a band advertising their rubbish little gig that they're having this weekend. I'm not interested because it, it muckies the place up. And so fly posting and things like that are already illegal. It's already illegal. And and also. When I mean, even just like general election time around here, which, you know, it's not too contentious, but people put stickers up on traffic lights and things like that, vote Labour, vote Conservative or whatever, and they just get picked off anyway because, you know, the, the, there's already the, the social code there that people don't want the, the streets scruffied up like that and people don't want to see people's politi political arguments um, argued out in public in that way either. So the the signage is already illegal. And then, like you say... As far as I'm concerned, if some idiot wants to open up a barber's, say, and then stick a sign in the window that says white people only, pff, good luck to you. Now, I'm not saying that I I support someone smashing that shop up. I'm not going to smash the shop up. I'm not going to burn it down. But if somebody does, I mean, in in today's environment, in today's multicultural environment, you're sort of asking for it. So, yeah. again... Yeah. No, it's 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 an interesting point, and it's a relationship that um, exists between the law doing something and social attitudes doing something. And one thought is that social attitudes can do this all themselves, and we don't need to worry about uh, having the law to orchestrate it or to add a formal cutting edge to the social attitudes. People will tear down the signs, beat up the barbers, and and and. Uh, um, uh, extinguish the burning crosses uh, without any without any intervention by the law. Uh, the government should not regard it as part of their uh, responsibility to be concerned about this. I think myself that it's not an either or and that law has an expressive function, an important expressive function uh, in these matters, and law has a leadership function. And I think particularly in the community that is facing the real prospect of intercommunal hostility and intercommunal violence of the sort you might see in, I don't know, Nigeria or India or in the north of Ireland, real um, tension, violence and hatred between communities. I think governments have a responsibility to think hard about what might cause that and usually has multiple causes and think hard about what the responsibility is of government itself and all the citizens to avert this if this seems to be a nightmare. So there you are, your, um, your uh, Home Secretary in 1964, when immigration is beginning to ramp up a little bit into Great Britain from East Africa and from the Indian subcontinent. Um, and somebody asks the Home Secretary to produce a paper on what the government should do to avert possible intercommunal hostility knowing perfectly well that once that hostility gets established, it's the devil's own task to get rid of it. And we're imagining, using the logic of your uh, concerns, that the Home Secretary would say, we shouldn't even worry about it. I don't care. Maybe social attitudes will take care of it. But this has nothing to do with government. And I think that although I can't say that it, it's absolutely something the government must do, I think if the government, if the Home Secretary reaches a informed judgment that this is something that perhaps we should do. I'm not going to condemn that, certainly not from a uh, ivory tower of uh, free speech absolutism. I would want to see what was at stake, what we know about uh, how these laws work, and what we know about the interaction between the laws and the popular and the popular attitudes. Yeah, you see, I just worry that, for, for me, it seems that the, the laws to, to govern that sort of situation are already in place. You know, you, you already can't, you already can't assault people. You can't. You, you can't. Uh, you know, graffiti somebody's house. Um, you can't attack somebody. 
Um, and even things with, you know, if you're going to be, um, it's you know, some sort of vulgar behavior like spitting on somebody in public, which is, you know, rightly classed as assault anyway, or um, using, uh, being aggressive and using racial epithet, epithets towards people, that's already public disorder. Um, and so, you know, I just, I just don't see... It, it, for, for, for those situations where there's violence involved, like Northern Ireland and it's, it's guns and bricks being thrown, those are already illegal. But for me, it's just it just feels still that one step too far to start trying to police what people can actually talk about. And my second concern with it would be that that um, either side could feel, I guess, that the the government is sort of bolstering the the, the opposing side. You know, it could be the case that the, the government is on one side or the other, but then there could be just the perceptions from both sides of the argument that the government's in favour of those and that the government intervention, especially at the level of speech, you can't even say this, you can't even express yourself, you can't express your uh, the, the, the issues that you have with this other community, that that's going to make tensions rise instead of, like, you know, what, what I would argue, which is leaving it to the, to the marketplace of ideas. Yeah, uh, on the last point, I think you're absolutely right that that has to be considered as a very strong possibility that this might make things worse. All legislation might have that effect. Um, and you're absolutely right. Uh, there are already laws against assault and there are already laws against racial terrorizing and there are already laws against uh, discrimination. So why aren't those laws sufficient? Uh, and that's a little bit, I mean, it's, it's, it's an important point, but it's a little bit like saying, look, we already have laws against poisoning people. So why do we have to fit emissions devices, emissions control devices to our automobiles? Because I know my automobile, uh, ancient though it is, is not going to poison anybody. Nothing but the emissions from 100,000 such automobiles will have a sufficient impact on lead levels or carbon monoxide levels to actually do damage to people. But we do sometimes concern ourselves with aggregate environmental harms and think really by analogy with that, that that may, may be what's going on here. Racial assaults and racial discrimination don't come out of nowhere. They thrive in a certain atmosphere. And the idea is, well, we have to sit around and let the atmosphere develop as it may under the marketplace of ideas um, until actual assaults take place, actual discrimination takes place, that we're not allowed to concern ourselves with the quality of the social atmosphere. We wouldn't put up with that argument for a moment with regard to automobile emissions or industrial emissions or, or anything. People are smart enough to see the case for um, uh, controlling tiny harms or the tiny contributions that individual speech might have on a uh, overall social environment, and especially in the circumstances where the government has to take some responsibility for what the social environment is going to be like, which is partly a matter of the assurance and the security that people have, not only that they won't happen to be assaulted, but that they can be assured that they won't be assaulted, or that they can walk into a store with an assurance that they won't be discriminated against. So those elements of security and assurance are related to these, to if you like, uh, Danny, the atmospherics, of, I think, of what, of what is at stake in the hate speech legislation. But everything that you've said about these being difficult judgments, I'm sure is right. Um, I just don't think we should flinch from them because they're difficult. We make difficult legislative judgments all the time. Um, I suppose another thing that sort of pops up for me when I was thinking about this was... Um, with this, we're using quite extreme examples here of, uh, you know, I mean, we've just, we've got, we've gone from, um, you know, people having sort of verbal disagreements to full on, you know, brick throwing riots and war and, and assault and things like that. That's, that's not, um, I, I don't know the metrics. I would argue that's probably with, with all the, the, the different arguments, social arguments and disagreements that go on that it, it it boils over into sort of physical assault and, and full-on warfare not very often. You know, the, the, the vast majority of the time, it's, it's, it's heated debate. It is people getting offended, um, which you, you make a distinction between offence and, and, and having dignity undermined, and, and, then, and then that as well. So 
people feeling their feeling that their dignity is undermined or that their their standing is objectively lowered in the eyes of society due to something that somebody else has said. Um, so if we, 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 we come away from those extremes for a moment and just concentrate on this, this idea of offence and, and, and dignity being undermined, one of the things that, that stood out to me is it felt in this idea of, uh, of think of uh, the, someone in the, uh, the, the Pakistani community in, um, in the UK and that, Somebody, somebody puts a poster up, or this signage goes up around the community that's uh, that's offensive towards that particular community, um, and it's you know it's quite aggressive. It's it's not someone stating objective facts in a sterile manner. Um, it it seems a bit paternalistic to me to assume that people's dignity is undermined automatically by virtue of being insulted based on their immutable characteristics that they need that they necessarily need to be protected from that because when we talking about talking about undermining someone's dignity one of my questions would be it, someone insults someone from the Pakistani community or the Pakistani community in general sorry their dignity is is undermined in in whose eyes because for, you know for me a, a a small group of racists can can be throwing throwing the p word around all all day for all that. that's I couldn't give a shit that's not going to undermine the Pakistani community's dignity in my eyes and also you know I, I think there's a lot of people in the Pakistani community that would feel the same way like call me what you want I don't give a shit what a a a, a, bun, a this small group of of rabid racists think um and also well what do you think about that first. Yeah, no, it's um, it's going to be a matter about how seriously you take the provisions of the legislation, which don't have anything to do with uh, insult as such, or as you said, anything to do with offence as such. They have to do with the likelihood of stirring up hatred, and hatred not in the eyes of the uh, the target group itself, but in the eyes of the broader community and their attitudes. So if we are sure that this speech is not going to stir up hatred, if we are sure that 100, that 99% of the onlookers hearing this are not going to change their attitudes towards the target group, then we haven't got the evidence of hate speech under the, the uh, legal definition of hate speech. But if we were sure that this was likely to stir up hatred in the community generally, so remember we're focusing on the attitudes not of the targeted group, but on those who surround the targeted group. We're sure that that was going to stir up attitudes, or for it was reasonably likely as an objective matter to stir up attitudes. And the question is, should we be indifferent to that probability? Or should we try to do something about it? Or to state it more fairly, should we obligate citizens not to generate that sort of uh, talk that would have that sort of effect? So it's perfectly possible. It's perfectly possible not only that the target group will develop the thick skins that are necessary for the sort of resilience that you were talking about. It's perfectly possible that um, the community generally will make itself thick-skinned enough to be impervious to the incitement, impervious to the stirring up, the attempt to stir up hatred that the racists try to generate. The racists who use this language are often trying to make contact with other racists. And they're calling out to each other. Um, when a group of neo-Nazis march through Skokie, Illinois in the 1970s. People talk endlessly about this case in America. I don't know whether they talk about it in, in Britain or not. But one of the things that Frank Collin, who was the leader of the Nazi group, said is, our aim is to, our aim is to um, reach the good people, the good, fierce anti-Semites who live among the Jews, to get them to come out of the woodwork and stand up for themselves, to get them to be assured that they're not alone. So to provide a degree of coordination for the orchestration of hatred. Or if your aim is simply to use racist smears, anti-Semitic smears to, to change the attitudes, if you can, change the attitudes of ordinary folks in the community, their attitudes towards the targeted group. And if the attitudes of the community are vulnerable to that sort of impact, then that's a hard case. That's the case that I think a free speech absolutist has to confront. Um, whether they should simply 
fold their arms and remain indifferent to this, as uh, if it is a real possibility. If it's not a real possibility, then then then, then perhaps it's not important. Yeah, you see, for, for me, it was it was more it was, it was this focus on this idea of dignity and undermining dignity, and. Um, that being a constituent part of what justifies um, hate speech legislation, and and another thing I, I'd say about some of the, the examples you give in the in the book, again, let's go with the, um, you know, the, the the Muslim father walking down the street with his daughter and, and sees the 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 signage. For me, again, someone that doesn't want the government sticking its big nose into into this uh, situation. It, though the, the examples in the book, I feel sort of lack further consideration. They sort of the the end at the point at which it's sort of most dramatic and upsetting, um, and so for for me, I w- I would argue that let's say, uh, you know, let's say someone's uh, post post swash stickers up around a community, around a black community or whatever, uh, and where black commu- sorry around a community where blacks are present but the the minority. Um, and that that might necessarily so let's say that let's say that small community of black people are offended by it and do feel that, that some indignity towards th- th- this taking place. Um, the, the 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 dignity can then be restored though by the community's own reaction to it. You know, the, often with, with things like this, I mean, there's just, you know, over in America, you see these examples of these, just, someone scribbled a, a swash sticker on a, on a, in a public bathroom and there's a huge outcry. I mean, it, it doesn't take flags up on, on flagpoles for it to happen that, you know, someone, someone can draw it in chalk on the floor and then the community, it, there's, there's a huge backlash to the community. There's, you know, they say hate has no home here, that sort of thing. Uh, there's, they, they remove the signage or whatever. There's a counter protest. And I would argue that that that's probably what happens more often than not, and that the community spirit and the commu- the community coming together after that 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 necessarily restores the 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 sen- the, the self felt sense of dignity within the the individuals within the black community, but it also um, upholds the the dignity of the black community within that wider community anyway. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Um, it's not an either or, of course, you can have both. Um, and the, 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 these effects that you're talking about would happen as often in Britain as they happen in the United States. That is that the community rallying around, expunging the swastikas, expressing support. This is not ruled out by the fact that you have the, uh, the Race Relations Act or the Public Order Act. So it's not an either or. Um, there is the concern, and it's a real concern, that within living memory, we still have memory of the stink of burning churches, as well as the stink of burning crosses. We still have memories of um, uh, informal codes of segregation. We still have memories of uh, patterns of racial assault. And we still have the reality of swastika paint-ups begetting other swastika paint-ups that are starting a trend. And that's as real, I mean, that's not to deny the phenomena that you're talking about. It's just, um, um, it's, it, it's not even complimentary. It's just another thing that happens. And communities have to take some responsibility for their social atmospheres. In the United States especially, I don't know what it's like in Britain. People in Britain uh, tend to be enormously complacent about race relations there, although I imagine it's a matter of who you speak to. But in the United States, we can't be. Right. In the United States, this has an, the ability to get out of hand, even though what you say about large sections of the community, good-hearted people rallying around to try to uh, act together and sustain and uh, repair the affronted uh, dignity of the targeted group. That's very important as well. I think it helps in in, uh, European countries and New Zealand or Australia that the law plays a role in in, uh, orchestrating that and formalising, giving expression to those communities community attitudes. But the most important thing I would stress is that the reactions that you've mentioned don't rule out and they don't preclude and they therefore no substitute for worrying about the proliferation of these offences and the fact that uh, we can go backwards as well as forward in these matters. We're not entitled. We haven't been entitled for 50 years to complacency uh, in this area. Um, that's why, for example, I think after the 7-7 bombings, 
in, uh, when was it, 2005 in London. Um, that's when the government passed religious hatred laws yeah, because they wanted to, as part of whatever devil's bargain they were entering into with very, very draconian security and anti-terrorist laws, they wanted to be sure that these were not going to be met with great intercommunal hostility between Islamic and non-Islamic sections of the population. So you had the, the religious hatred laws introduced to add to, to complement the racial hatred laws that had already been there for, for um, uh, 30 or 40 years. Um, so people have to, have to worry about the resurrection of old hatreds, the awakening of old nightmares, and the development of new forms of intercommunal hatred. And in modern multicultural societies, there's no alternative to some degree of vigilance about that, it seems to me. Right. So I want, I want to move on now to, um, well, I guess we're getting even more dealing with the, the, the grey area here. Um, because, see, a lot, of, a lot of the emphasis on the book, in the book, is talking about vulnerable minority groups. Yeah. Um, but there are, of course, there's, there can be, there can be uh, disagreements between minority groups as well. Um, and I want to get into that in, in a number of ways first. One, one, one thing, one example that came up for me was the, the issue of sort of implicit versus explicit expressions of hate speech. And a really, a really interesting one that happened over here, I don't know if it made its way in, onto the news in America at all, but there was a, there's a, a feminist activist called Kelly J. Keen Minchel, um, she's better known as Posey Parker, uh, as uh, on a, she's a blogger, I think. Uh, um, yeah, I think that's what she does and a YouTube channel and what have you. Now she had a billboard put up in Liverpool, which simply said, it said woman, noun, adult, human, female. And the, somebody complained to, uh, I think the, complain to the police and to the, the billboard company about this, uh, that this was hate speech. And what's interesting about this one, aside from the, the relative truth of the statement, because it is quite literally a dictionary definition, is depending on who you ask, that could either be construed as an attack on trans people, or it could be classed as a, as a call of solidarity towards women who feel that their plight is being undermined by trans activists. Sure. Um, now that, that case was dropped. It, you know, she didn't end up going to court for it or anything like that, but still that's, um, that's now sort of a blight on her reputation as an act of, of hate speech. And, what well, what do you make of something like that? Because that's a real tricky one. Yeah, it it is. Uh, I wouldn't care to comment on Kelly J. Key Mitchell's uh, 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 billboard. I don't think. Um, certainly, if there were to be a prosecution, it would have to be done among officials and among jurors and among uh, judges who were alive to the implicit dimensions of whatever controversy she's buying into there. And, and, and um, ham-fistedly, it would be uh, wrong for me to get into that example. But I'll give you another example. I'm sorry just to be bucking the hypothetical, Danny, but okay. um, go to cross burning, um, which who's, uh, the legality of prohibitions on cross burning have, have been, have been, uh, has been debated in America for a long, long time. And one of the suggestions has been that cross burning is not explicitly threatening and it's not explicitly intimidating. People burn crosses for all sorts of reasons. They want to have a party, they want to have. And um, occasionally you will have members of the African American community reminding people that what seems like just one implicit meaning among others is actually the dominant meaning and the nightmarishly dominant meaning of this action in the eyes of others. And the law or social attitudes or both have to be alert to that. So 
In the case of Virginia against Black, uh, this is a case from 2003, there was a dissent, a marvelous dissent, um, by Justice Clarence Thomas, who's African American, who reproached the, uh, the members of the majority on the Supreme Court because they had said cross burning is not necessarily an implicit threat or an implicit piece of racism. He says, in our culture, this is a quotation, cross burning has almost invariably meant lawlessness and understandably instills in its victims well grounded fear of physical violence. Yet here the majority strikes down the statute because one day an individual might wish to burn a cross, but might do so without an intent to intimidate anyone. That cross burning subjects its targets and sometimes an unintended audience to extreme emotional uh, distress and is virtually never viewed merely as unwanted communication is of no concern to the majority. So there he's putting the view that we have to be alert to implicit meanings, particularly when these implicit meanings are vivid, well-known, nightmarish. Now, how that relates to whatever the connotations were of uh, Posey Parker's um, uh, uh, billboard, I don't know. You but see, it does mean... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just... You see, for me, it's almost that when it comes to something like cross-burning and you're able to cite the, the history behind it um, so starkly and then then maybe the, the message isn't isn't as as implicit you know it's 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 arguably explicit in that sense whereas Damn close, yeah yeah where, right. whereas somebody putting up a billboard that says that's got the diction, dictionary definition of a woman on it and then that is you know if you open any dictionary in the land it will say the same thing and so yeah. by virtue of accusing this billboard of of having this implicit message you could say the same about the the dictionary and all the organisations that put dictionaries out, and it's for me right. it almost becomes that then with implicit messaging, it's in the eye of the beholder or in the eye of the offended. You know, it becomes it it, it becomes up to the person that's offended, or maybe even chosen to be offended by the message, to insert the the implicit intention the implicit message behind it and which might not even be there and then the person is then therefore going to be judged based on the 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 implicit message that's been inserted by somebody else and that for me that's is right. hugely and, and troubling right and that's certainly going to be a um that's certainly going to be a possibility in cases of this sort but not all cases of implicit meaning will be like this some of them will be much more patent like the cross burning yeah. example and there's probably room for a range of cases in between, which means we're back in one of these gray areas. Um, and certainly, um, I think it's important not to just focus on the subjective reactions of the t members of the targeted group. It's going to have to focus on the reactions of the people around them as well. And with any objective test for what the reasonable person would infer from this piece of signage, We'll be wanting to look at a, at a broad spectrum of reactions. And, and you've heard me, uh, even just in the hour we've been talking this afternoon, emphasizing that there are gray areas. There is a range of cases. And probably it's a good idea for, this, for these laws to do their work at the extreme end rather than mm. at the controversial end of the gray area, which is partly why we have these filters and partly why we have these safe havens uh, to try to protect um, to try to protect um, free expression if we can. Because countries that have hate speech laws, we, we suggested that this was almost every advanced democracy uh, in the West, they also have strong and robust commitments to free speech. They may not be free speech absolutists. Actually in America, it's, it's hard to find a free speech absolutist. Um, but uh, there is a tendency to try to design the statutes so that there is some compromise or balance struck with free speech. So um, I don't want to quote your own laws to you, but Section 29J of the Public Order Act, which now embodies the religious hatred provision, it says, nothing in this part shall be read or given effect in a way which prohibits or restricts discussion, criticism, or expressions of antipathy, dislike, ridicule, insult, or abuse of particular religions or the beliefs or practices of their adherents, or proselytizing or urging adherents of a different religion to cease practicing their religion or belief system. 
It's only a tax on the reputation or the social standing, the dignity of the believers that are prohibited. You can say what you like about the creeds, say what you like about Jesus Christ or Muhammad or L. Ron Hubbard or whoever, whoever it is that you may want to make fun of. And so there's a tendency to use the detail of legislative drafting to try to take care of some of these, some of these issues. Now, you might say reasonably that each of these exceptions brings in a gray area of its own, and, and it does. So we have gray areas upon gray areas. We have gray areas for the definition of the offense, and we have gray areas for the definition of these safe havens. Um, that, to my mind, is an example of good, sophisticated uh, legislative drafting rather than a sign of confusion or ambivalence. Um, and one of the things that I did, I know we have to come to an end pretty soon, but one of the things I was trying to do uh, in the Harm and Hate Speech book was to make sure that the mainly American audience could be made familiar with the complexity and sophistication of legislative drafting on these issues. I mean, I'll just quickly say as well, the, f the first thing that springs to mind there with that example is um, saying that the, this legislation in place that protects free speech in Britain. I mean, are, you f are you familiar with the, the case of uh, the comedian, Count Dankula? Um, and his, well, see, this was what a guy... So this is a guy that he, he, his girlfriend had a dog that he didn't like. It was one of those sort of, it was a little girly dog, I guess, he, and he wasn't fond of it. And so, and his girlfriend thought it was the most amazing little thing in the world. And so he wanted to, a way to make the dog um, less, uh, less likable, <laughs> I guess. And so he taught the dog to do a Zeke Heil with its paw whenever he prompted it by saying, gas the Jews. And then he got this on, on video. So he said, gas the Jews, and the dog put, put its dog put its paw up in the air. Now, he ended up being prosecuted for that under our hate speech laws. Um, now, it's a joke. Now, it's not... Now, well, regardless of whether it's a good joke, whether regardless of whether or not it's a well-thought-out joke, it was a joke, and the intent was clearly... Uh, as a joke and the, and the reason you can establish that the intent of it was a joke and that the guy doesn't actually support uh, Nazi propaganda Nazi uh, hatred of the Jews is implicit within that joke what makes it a joke is the fact that this is a terrible thing to make a dog do you know he didn't make he didn't make the dog um, you know uh, I don't know do, do a, a funny smile with its mouth at some other word he made it do something that he, this is, I know this is offensive. So that's why I'm going to make the dog do it. So that's why you can tell it's a joke. And for me, when the, this is a perfect example of the law, because law is based on precedent as well, isn't it? And so yeah. once, once people are being prosecuted for telling a joke, for me, that's a perfect example of why I don't want the government stepping in. Because if now we're, we're, we're exacting hate speech laws on people for telling a joke, quite literally, where does it end? <laughs> okay, so um, uh, let's have a look at this. As you know, there and back in the day when we used to have uh, air travel, um, there were a great many people denied boarding and a great many people arrested for telling jokes at security checkpoints, jokes about bombs, jokes about explosives in their luggage. And surprise, surprise, the plea that I was just telling a joke was no defense. The idea was we needed to, to have these checkpoints and security checks to meet a real and present danger. And having people um, making joking uh, uh, wordplay about bombs or explosives uh, was not helpful to that. So sometimes if you're going to patrol speech, you're going to end up patrolling a variety of speech acts, a variety of uh, telling a joke is one speech act, citing statistics is another, uh, Engaging in a piece of advocacy is another speech act, maybe burning a cross is another, putting something on a T-shirt and so on. And you can always find a description that makes it seem outrageous that somebody would be punished just for telling a joke. Um, he walked into a synagogue and said, gas the Jews, and then said, well, it was just a joke. Um, but you have to take the context into, into consideration, and the context you may, is... That's right, but the context is a matter of uh, whether... Uh, what he thought the impact, what he could might reasonably ha have been expected to think the impact of what he said 
was uh, in that case. But the mere fact that it was a joke leaves aside the crucial question. Joke tells us what sort of speech act it was. It doesn't tell us what the content of the speech act was and doesn't tell us what the effect of the speech act was. And as I said, you know, we, we, we use rules against telling jokes. There are big signs at airport checkpoints saying no jokes about explosives. Yeah? And you say, ah, idiots, why are they banning the telling of jokes? Haven't they got a sense of humor? No, they don't, because they have a very, very hard job to do in very quick circumstances. So, um, so I'm not convinced by the mere fact that there was a joke. I mean, it was, it was a you know, marvelous attempt at humor, and, and no doubt. And, um, but uh, if he had asked me, should I go ahead with this particular joke, I'd say, of course not. They grow up and... Um, yeah, I just, yeah, I just, I think, I think, I think, I think the comparison with the like the airport security, it's that's the fire in a crowded theatre thing again. Whereas the idea that you know getting a dog to stick its paw in the air is going to incite violence against Jews or you know resurrect the the Third Reich, it's, it, I mean, it just strikes me as ridiculous. But that's you know that's that's set a legal precedent now over here. Um, let me just let me just close upon a couple of things which I'd be negligent of me to to leave out so yeah. I, I guess um and, uh, and i know it's tricky jeremy but try and answer these as, as quickly as possible if you can just so sure. just so i can squeeze them in so the first the first one is um we, we've sort of spoken about um he, well what you what are sometimes referred to sarcastically by conservatives as hate facts so stating something factual um but like we've been talking about, hey, you, you can state a fact in in a way that's 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 unhelpful or that um, that might. Um, again, I'm I'm very dubious about this this cause and effect relationship between speech and violence, and and I think that's because um, you know it, if it's it's the old argument if you know just because someone tells you to go jump off a bridge, you don't have to do it. You're a, you're an independent agent, and the idea that someone can you know tell you to go and commit some atrocity. And you go ahead and do it, and then blame it on the person that voiced that. Um, yeah. it, it, again, even though I, I I do draw the line at inciting violence, I do think these. Um, I think it's it's ridiculous to sometimes lay the blame at somebody based on speech. Um, let me let let me give you another awkward statistic. So, um, eighty percent of rapists in Sweden. Um, this for, sorry, this is from the the, the Gatstone Institute, twenty fifteen. 85% of rapists in Sweden were non-Swedish immigrants. So uh, 40 years after the Swedish parliament unanimously decided to change formerly homogenous Sweden into a multicultural society, violent crime has increased 300% and rapes by 1,472%. Sweden is now number two on the list of rape countries surpassed only by Lesotho in Southern Africa. Now, yeah. someone might read that statistic and then they go out with a placard that says they rape our women, for instance... Now that's that's uh, what you might class as hate speech, but it's based on uh, it's based on a factual statistic, statistic. What would be an appropriate way to express that frustration? So you might you might ask simply about the person who wants to go out with the billboard. What's his intention in putting this out? Is his intention simply to open a sociological debate? Yes. Or is his intention well, is his intention realistically let, let's not yes well let's let's, let, let's say let's say realistically he's read this he, he say he's a swedish patriot but not racist okay yeah. he's a swedish patriot he's read this statistic he's he's got daughters say as well which is um you know ever since having a daughter has made me a million times more suspicious of the world um so he's got daughters he's a swedish patriot he's read this statistic and he thinks right immigration it needs to be. It doesn't necessarily have to stop, but it needs to slow down. We need to. We need to get a, a handle on this. You know, I'm not a blogger. I'm not. I'm not particularly articulate, or you know, I'm not good at rhetoric or anything like that. I, I, I can wave a placard. What should that placard say? Oh, what should the placard? Oh, who knows what the placard should say? Oh, so what's, will... what's an appropriate? What's an appropriate way to conduct yourself to get that message across? Uh, you write a letter to. Uh, whatever forum you think will uh, attract the attention of those you want to reach, and you indicate as clearly as you can, uh, using as moderate language as you can, what the statistics are that trouble you. Um, so that's one thing. In many countries where there are rules about defamation, there are limits on the truth defense. And one limit on the truth defense is truth is not a defense if the 
if the message was expressed maliciously, if the message was expressed with an intention to damage the reputation of right. the targeted group, for example. So Massachusetts has that doctrine uh, in, its, in, its, in its laws. Um, and I think there's something similar in the case of expressions of racial hatred. If we might say that particular placard, the first one that you mentioned, um, had been produced in the heat of great anger to go out and try to generate an upswelling of anger at the minority group uh, affected, with a view, no doubt, to changing um, immigration policy, but the immediate intention, let's suppose that the immediate intention was the, to try to generate an upswelling of anger, then the question is whether that would be an appropriate target for hate speech legislation. And I think in that case where the person knew and intended that or ought to have known, so that we have a requirement of some sort of degree of responsibility, then that may be important. Now, it's true, and this is addressing the second thing that you said, that um, we don't want to be in the position of shifting the blame from members of his audience who then go out and beat up uh, uh, Swedish immigrants, shift the blame, blame from them to him. They're going to be liable for the assault, but it's not a zero-sum game. We, when, we, when we convict people of incitement, we don't, we don't uh, exculpate the targets of that, of that incitement. We go after both. And as you have said yourself, uh, incitement to violence is the one exception to most people's free speech absolutism. And you and I agree about that. It's just that if we accept that um, such incitement uh, uh, has to be a, a legitimate concern of the law, the question is by the same logic, might there be other things that fall short of incitement, but nevertheless are calculated in some way to have an effect on, 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 on the members of this hostile community, should the law be concerned with those two. And that, I think, is where we differ. Okay. And then quickly, the, fi the final two, you should be able to answer these quite quickly, I think. One is, with, with the, the emphasis on vulnerable minorities that's in the book, I'm just wondering if you you personally think that, the, that any hate speech legislation that's brought in should apply to minority groups as well so for instance you know so often the, the frustrations expressed by minority groups towards their perceived oppressor um can often be perceived as hate speech you know a couple of years ago there was a, a popular hashtag kill all white men um was 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 on twitter um yeah. now um what what do you think of that oh um i think that we have to uh prohibit that sort of hate speech as well hate speech from minority members aimed at or targeting uh, the dignity of majority members as well. Partly it's a matter of just the necessary generality of um, the rule of law in these matters, but partly it's, it's the fact that some of the arguments for a well-ordered society require that people take responsibility for what they say about the members of the majority as well as what members of the majority say about members of various minorities. So I have no problem with this sort of what's source for the goose is source for the gander yep. type of um, approach. I think it has to be administered even-handedly. And in many countries, in some countries, my country, New Zealand, um, some of the best-known hate speech prosecutions have been uh, of Maori activists attacking Europeans or Pākehā, as we call uh, white people in New Zealand. Yeah. So um, I think, you know, it, it, all of this is quite consistent with the fact that the underlying concern look to vulnerable minority groups. But the nature of that concern uh, is, is uh, uh, inclusive of um, minority attacks on majority members as well. Yeah, and then um, in, in one of the, the closing chapters of the book, um, I, I, just, I have to throw this question out there because um, you were you're sort of unconvinced about this as a, a, as a concern, but I think, it, I think it stands as maybe a philosophical point. Um, and that's... The hate speech laws applying even in cases where the where it's being the the target of the hate speech are guilty of hate speech themselves. So, say if you have somebody holding up uh, a sign that says "Kill all Nazi scum," um, again, where where do you stand on that one? 
<laughs> I think I stand in the in the same place as you, which would be if there are going to be hate speech laws, then they have to apply to that as well. Um, so that uh, the fact that the hate speech was itself a response to hate speech is is not and shouldn't be treated as any sort of uh, exculpation. Um, it's wrong to stir up stir up hatred even against Nazi scum. Right. Um, probably wrong to stir up hatred against scum of any description. And um, so again, that's one of the paradoxical. It it is a paradoxical conclusion. Fortunately. Um, more important philosophically than in real life, but it's 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 important where you're seeing a society teetering on the edge of intercommunal violence, as I've said, which is going to be quid pro quo hatred, quid pro quo uh, defamation, quid pro quo attacks eventually, and quid pro quo violence. Uh, we want to work at both ends of that possibility. We don't want to assume that only one community is guilty and the other community is purely victim. And um, I think it's 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 important for an honourable hate speech law to take that possibility very seriously. Right. Okay. So that's given people plenty to chew on. I must say, Jeremy, after this conversation and, and after reading the book, and I will I'll go through it page by page. I think it's something it's important for me to go through just by the, the nature of this podcast, having difficult, controversial conversations. It's going to be worthwhile me going through uh, with a fine tooth comb. I don't feel like I don't feel like I've budged. I still feel, um, I still feel like the 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 hand of the government. It's it, it's 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 or the arm of the government. It's too strong an arm to bring to bear on on the situation, and um, I I remain unconvinced. But I would just throw what one final question to you would be: Is 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 well one is there is there anything you'd like to? Uh, is there anything you'd like to say in closing or is there anything in particular you'd like to say, maybe one final consideration for people like myself who've got to the end of this podcast and thought, no, I'm still, I'm still not down with hate speech laws. Right. One question would be whether they, you think you've wasted your time, whether even in the midst of the, the discussion, you've learned about its complexity and you've learned about the, um, the way in which some of your concerns are addressed and you've learned about how some of the concerns have been answered, not always answered successfully, but that answers have been brought forward. And one of the aims, I mean, it's, it's not a long book, as you know, it's only a couple of hundred pages and they're rather short pages at that. But the aim was to make sure that the opponents of hate speech legislation were given chapters to themselves. So there yeah. was a chapter on concerns about political legitimacy. There was chapters about marketplace of ideas or chapters about um, the dangers of taking offense too seriously and so on. Yep. So the important thing was to indicate the complexity of the debate. Too many people rush into this debate. They, they, they say, as Salman Rushdie, whom I have a great admiration for, but Salman Rushdie once said, if anybody wants to restrict speech, I'm going to stop listening. And that is often people's attitude. The aim of the book wasn't to convert anybody, except converting them to the view that there's a little bit more to be said for this legislation than they might have thought, even if they haven't been convinced. And just even learning what leg the legislation is like, learning what the precedents are like, learning what the possible abuses are like, and, and surprise, surprise, the defenders of the legislation are well aware of the, of the possibilities of abuse. I think all of that is important to have, a, have, to, to have, if you like, the marketplace of ideas applied to the hate speech debate itself. Yeah, well, I, I, w I would recommend the book to people because even though I've, I've still come out with the, the same conclusions that I had before, it was... Uh, it was worth it's worth wrestling with it's worth doing that i mean i always i always advocate for that anyway if if that was one of the things that in in my political evolution over the years i've always challenged i've always tried to read both you know books on both sides of the of the aisle but i'd neglected to do that with this particular issue and so it there was there's plenty there was plenty of um times in the book where it made me pause and think oh hang on a minute i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to wrestle with that a little bit um and so i definitely recommend it to people on that front and like i say full disclosure i haven't gone through it with a fine tooth comb and read every single page so maybe this is a pretty good job yeah you've some, done a pretty good job well thank you very much so maybe there's maybe there's some material still left in there but um in the meantime jeremy is there any links or websites uh projects anything you'd like to make people aware of uh, just give it a little plug or anything like that no, the book was published around 2012, 2013, so it's been around for a while. 
Um, I don't have any particular website to, to give a plug for. I've moved on to other things since this. Yep. So this is a nice welcome opportunity to come back to this. Um, I have a new book coming out on targeted killing of terrorists. That's a different a different. Oh, interesting. Oh, well, hey, yeah. maybe we can uh, maybe revisit that one at some point in the future. That sounds right. If you would that. like, I'd be, ha I'd, I'd be very happy to. Yes, it's called that... Targeted Killing for and Against. Yeah. And I'm, I'm against. So, uh... Okay, that sounds right up my street. So, yeah, let's, let's do that at some point in the future. Yes, we'll touch base. Excellent. As always, the links to uh, Jeremy's book will be in the show notes. So just look for them in your, your app or wherever you happen to or on youtube wherever you happen to um digest this podcast in the meantime jeremy waldron thank you very much for joining me yeah thank you jeremy i enjoyed it Certainly.